All right, welcome to today's episode of the Australian Lawn and Garden Podcast. It's a very unique episode. It's not an episode where we sit down and talk with somebody one-on-one. We actually got the opportunity to essentially do this interview whilst walking around the world-class stadium, Adelaide Oval, with assistant curator JT, or Jonathan Trenorden as his full name. Now, Adelaide Oval is one of the best stadiums in Australia and by default the world. They do a whole host of sports from AFL and cricket to soccer and even apparently stadium golf, which I found out for the first time this time. Ben Sims from Lawn Tips tagged along for the ride. We actually did a live event that night with head curators, Ben and JT, where people got to ask questions. That'll be an episode coming out soon. But this is a very unique video and I really hope you enjoy it. The tour of Adelaide Oval. We've got JT, backward handshake. Okay. We're going to do a tour of Adelaide Oval. We're going to look at the practice pitches. We're going to look at where they keep their stuff, how they maintain it, go into all sorts of technical stuff. Really interesting behind the scenes look at one of the most respected ovals probably in the world. Let's get into it. So the guys are all over here. Yep. I'm assuming that you start off, if you're working here, your first responsibility is out here. Yeah, yeah, the parkland usually is the first step, um, and then you kind of work your way through up to the oval. This grass here, what's this? This is Santa Ana. Shit. Oh, they should know With that. a bunch of poa and dry. <laughs> <laughs> so we, um, we actually did spray it pre emergent this year. It's just, um, I think it will germinate above that layer of the pre emergent, so we would start ripping it out. You'd probably have a pretty shallow root system for that. Right. Again, this is a car park. Look, look what he sees. So really? Yeah, every weekend, this is full of cars. Wow. No way. Yeah. This looks like, I mean, it's, it's obviously the weather's really cold. There was ice in the car this morning, so you're never going to get as green a colour as you would in nah, it's green. This was probably our first morning with a close to a frost, uh, so we'll probably see a little bit of colour leave now onwards, um, especially when it's getting parked on every week. Yes, so we've come, come this weekend, we'll get parked on and we'll probably start seeing roadways where they drive regularly. Yep. <clears throat> but the colour, I mean, so what about this guy? What? So that's our uh, centre wicket. Uh, that has had a pretty high end fertiliser put on it a couple of weeks ago, so that should have a bit of colour. It hasn't had any frost and it hasn't had any traffic, so that's as good as it gets. It's also had a crop dress and a clay has a fair bit of nutrient in it. Yeah. So that is almost like a pseudo fertilizer in itself. What clay do you use? So we use out here, it's from uh, O'Halloran Hill. The drop-ins over here are from Appleson. It's yep. like a market garden. Really? And then these two drop-ins here as well. And we've gone the O'Halloran Hill soil here as well. So, have these pitches, so these are the same ones being used at internationals? So, we play, I don't actually know which one it was, now I can't even tell. It must be this one, had the test match on it. Right, um, so this so here is a test match wicket. Yes, in not very good condition at the moment. Well, so I mean, it's it's six months away from being played on, well, maybe not really, but... Uh, yeah, when is our test match this year? I'll have to look that up. Okay. Well, that's cool. Like, it's cool to see, like... So, so this is legend <clears throat> as well. This is not the Santa Ana. So yeah. these, these are kind of like our little baby pet projects. Um, when our drop-ins over here weren't breaking up and behaving like we wanted them to, like a traditional wicket block, we started looking at ways that we could make that happen. So working with Saka, we've developed these. Uh, with the higher clay content and a different grass. So this legend is not quite as tight as the Santa Ana. So we were hoping to, with less stolens and rhizomes, to break up a bit more. Um, and we have seen signs of cracking and breaking up more than what we have in this legend uh, in the Santa Ana ones. Yeah. But we still do, it's still a work in progress. How does drop-ins work like? You have to get a like fill a big truck, like cut them out. Okay. Yeah, so I'll take you over. This is our transporter over here. Uh, that is the telescope in at the moment. So that comes out and it's 30 meters long. And then each pitch has 18 lifting lugs down right. each side. So we drive that over the top of it, yeah. um, lower it down, put the lifting lugs in. 
and it will lift up in one joint, 30 ton trade. Because yeah. I've like, seen this little seam here, right? Yeah. So there's a piece of metal somewhere. Yeah, so there's a metal wall. Oh, nice. both, both sides of the trays. Oh, nice. uh, the through like, there. Yeah, and you can actually see the power likes the joints because there is a lot more air void through there. So there's right. um, less pack and a lot more room for its roots. So it does germinate quite well in the gaps. Wow, so that's really interesting. So it's not. It's literally just the soil, the compaction of the soil makes a weed harder or easier to grow. Yeah, yeah. Thought, I've never thought about that. Oh. And Power, you guys... Power is probably particularly <coughs> susceptible to their compaction uh, more than a... others, but yeah. I love like that. One of the things as well about this is like, so you're growing this grass in a really, because it's a shallow tray, right? Uh, it's about 150 mil. Okay, so it's a little bit deeper than yeah, I thought. Yeah. So then... But then, do you roll it in all the time, or no. just before a match? Uh, so when it goes out into the middle of the oval, we'll give it a, a whole block, a cross roll, and roll it until we're happy with it being flat. And then it's a case of picking which pitch is for what game, and then start to prep accordingly. So yeah, test match for example, we're usually looking at a seven or eight day prep, depending on the weather. Shields probably five or six, and then um, as you get into your big bash games, we're regularly on a three or four day prep if we have to, um, and sometimes it's shorter if that pitch has already been used. So how many pitches are here? About eight, six? Yeah, it's five out here. Oh, okay, so what I'm what I'm curious about is: is there ever a moment where you say you've got this guy prepared for the test match? Yeah. But this guy here was maybe for a one day or a month away, I don't know. Yeah. Do you ever go, this is a better test match wicket, let's switch him? Uh, not really. We try and keep our pitches the same. We have swapped and changed a little bit, but we are also somewhat hampered by our pre-season work because we'll highlight what game we want for the long format and what ones we want for white ball. And we'll, for the white ball, we'll give it a light scarify and top, uh, top dress and we'll start getting grow mats on it so that we're getting a nice soft leaf. Whereas our, our long ball, our shield pitch is our test pitch, we want a really thick, coarse mat of grass. Right. So we're not scarifying it, we're almost not mowing it, we're just clipping it at like 14, 15 mil just to try and encourage that thick, coarse grass. Stuff. And then when you're cutting it for the wicket, yeah, because people will make a decision on like how much grass they want to leave on to so curators. So, um, a little bit more about you, a little bit of background, because you will do the pitch on your own sometimes. Sometimes it's hoffy, uh, yeah, and then other times it's tight as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's a few of you that will make that decision. What goes into your mind if you're clipping at 14? You can't play on for well, technically. I guess you could. No one, you'd lose your job. Yeah. But, <laughs> But you go, okay, how much am I going to cut off? Do you have a science behind that or is it all gut feel? Uh, it's a bit of both. Um, having said that though, we will start our prep with our 14 mil of grass. So we'll start with our 14 mil and we'll work our way through the rollers, starting as early in the prep as we can, as wet as we can without pushing water, without blackening it up. And that 14 mil of grass just over time will compress and get pushed into the clay. So it's not, uh, it's still 14 mil of grass, but it's not a 14 mil height of cut of grass, if that makes sense. It's getting pushed down. Yeah, so um, during a prep of a shield game, for example, we could start at 14 mil, not cut it until the day before the game. We can drop the mower to probably six mil and not take anything off. So oh wow! Um, so what's what's your height of cut? Is it fourteen? Is it six? Or is it four? Which is what we'd have to get down to to actually cut grass off. It's, so really, and that's like yeah, right. You're creating a surface that's completely different than just leaving it and then cutting. Yeah. Correct. And how does that affect the play? I guess it well, yeah. Is it better for pace bowling, holding up for that? Does it break up for the spin bowling? Again, it depends on what format we're using. So white ball cricket, we've, we're not we're not cutting at 14 mil. We're down at your yeah, six to eight mil and then we yeah. prep it. And then you're potentially down at three to four mil by the uh, 
game day. Uh, white ball when you're at four mil and it's a nice soft leaf and it's pressed into the surface, the ball hits it, kisses on, and we get a decent amount of uh, pace and bounce and carry. With the thick mat, there is, we do have to be careful with the thick mat because we'll get criticised for tennis ball bounce if it's too thick and too soft and we haven't rolled it in enough because yeah. the ball will pitch, grip and then volley pop up. Yeah. Um, and likewise, if we had our 14 mil and we had to belt it to get it in and get it down, <coughs> all of a sudden we've got a flat stinker of a pitch where the ball is just doing absolutely nothing. It's over compacted and it's a run fest for the bat. It's, Can we walk over to the um, transporter? But I want to hear about your experience because you were at, while we're walking, you were at Amy before. I was. And so, for those who are unaware, there was a football stadium, a dedicated football stadium. Yep. Amy Park, I think it was. Yeah, Amy Stadium. Well, football park, and it was um, commercial rights to Amy Stadium. And so, AFL. Um, now, then, what they happened is they combined the sort of the cricket stadium, which was Adelaide Oval, did a massive upgrade on it, and you came across. Yep. So, were you doing any cricket before? No, we weren't. I had some cricket experience through, through my apprenticeship, uh, but prior to that, I hadn't done it at Amy Stadium. And so, I've developed everything since moving over here. And what was your role at Amy? Uh, I was just a groundsman back then. Uh, that was ten something years ago now. So, yeah, it was just a groundsman, um, and I've just worked my way up since being here. Right. right so, it would have been a big. Um, a learning curve to get to the point where you're doing the international wickets. Yeah, it was. Um, I've always enjoyed it and found it pretty easy to pick that up. Um, something I enjoy, so I do spend a lot of time thinking about it. So the more you think about it, the easier it is to develop skills, I think. Do you I've had some pretty good mentors as well along the way between Damo and a couple of the older boys that have now retired. <laughs> it's been a Good learning curve, I've enjoyed the whole time. How many times have you woken up in the night realised that you're dreaming about kicker wickets? Uh, no. Yeah, probably too many. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually more around the weather. It's gonna, <laughs> if you hear it raining here, and it can get up itself. This thing is a beast. It is a beast. So we're uh, halfway through the process of upgrading it as well. We're just um, working. Putting a new hydraulic system on it and a bigger engine. Um, we've started doing the drop ins down at Carangol as well. They've got two drop ins down there. And we've also just worked to deal with North Sydney Council to put this on a truck and transport it over there and do their drop ins. So they've got five drop ins that we help them with as well. What is a cog? Because this will be custom made, right? Yeah, yeah. I think there's three in Australia. Gee whiz. So what, like, how can there only be three? So Strathair is the owner and designer of it all. So they go they, ship this to Sydney or maybe? Uh, they look after the MCG. Right. They do the MCG drop-ins. When we redeveloped the oval and we got drop-ins, we bought one because we didn't want to rely on Strathair having to come over here and move it every six months yeah um, and then likewise at optus they bought one as well because it's obviously a long way across the nullarbor to be taken to be transported every six months no sure so but yeah because there's more than is there any other stadiums marble would do drop-ins a lot of people have drop-ins but a lot of them are now cut in half so they just cut them or they transport them with a crane so the crane comes over picks them up Puts them on a flatbed truck and then they drive them out. Right. Um, would rather the whole pinch of one so that you don't have that joint in the middle. Yeah. You've got uh, Geelong have drop ins, there's a couple of drop ins in Darwin, uh, Metricon. Look at those wheels. That is huge. And it's cold as well. So. <laughs> uh, that's nuts. Do you know how much this thing costs? I don't know. Yeah, it would be north of a million dollars now. That's nuts. Yeah. That is nuts. I think I prefer to have a Lamborghini though. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do with it? <laughs> Play cricket, man. <laughs>
first down, nice straight standing on top. <laughs> how fast? How fast does it go? Ah, uh, not very fast. <laughs> uh, about you can four or five k's an hour. All yeah. right. <laughs> you wouldn't. You wouldn't want it to have the ability to do like twenty and then nah, lose control. Yeah. Be, uh, be running pretty quick. <laughs> As it is, dude. Nah. So we've got remote control. So oh. one operator at each end. Hey. Um, so we've got a control box that sits in front of us. You've got to control it the whole way around. It's the most expensive remote control vehicle I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> Some IC guys out there, like, they've just loved a new hobby. I'm going to be a curator just for the just to twice it. a year I get to put in and then put out pictures. So you didn't get much of it. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so it's actually a long night. <laughs> we'll start at 6pm and work through until 4 or 5 in the morning. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, it's no. in the road. Why do you have to do it at night? Um, we found that the flooring that we put out on the oval to protect it burns the turf. So oh, the first couple true. of years we did it, it almost turned it into a stew. It, we yeah. rolled up the flooring and it stuck and it was dead. Yeah. And you could see it the entire cricket season. So mm. we just adapted over the years and we can now do it overnight. How many people here helping out with this stuff? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Obviously a few. <laughs> so, well, it's got a little bit murky over the last six months. Just, we had 12, um, and with starting turf solutions, we've kind of taken staff from the oval to turf solutions, um, and then we've hired more apprentices and more staff here. Uh, I'll have to count. <laughs> uh, okay. I don't actually know the number. What's, um, and tell me about turf solutions. Yeah, um, so turf solutions, look, that was created, um, mainly by Damo. Um, he saw a gap in the market where there was a lot of experience that we had. We had a lot of uh, machinery that sits there not being used for a large part of the year. So now we go out, um, do work on schools, sporting clubs, um, tennis courts, a lot of ovals and things like that. And it's just about, um, well, it's multifaceted, but there's a lot of renovations and maintenance. Um, we did the drop-ins for the ICC World Cup that's just been played. So there's a lot with uh, solutions there. The big difference between doing the drop-ins for an ICC World Cup and renovating a local school, though. Yeah, there is. <laughs> very broad. If I understand correctly, you, the drop-in pitches were made here. They're, yeah, the steel tray was fabricated here. Fabricated okay, here? Yep. Where was the soil from? Over there, so we've used natural okay. soil. So you've shipped over a drop-in pitch yep. to Florida originally, yep. Yep. grown a cricket pitch in Florida, yep. and then trucked it up to New York yes. for what? Six games? Ten games? Yeah, something like that. A week yeah, and a half it's... or something like that, and then they built an entire temporary stadium yep. and then tore it down. Yeah, correct. It's crazy. <laughs> Absolutely crazy. But I think um, from all reports, it was pretty successful. Um, Pitches probably didn't play as nice as we wanted them to, but given a time frame of five months from start to finish, we you know, were pretty happy with the work we put into them. Yeah, I did. I did see there was some like criticism on the pitches, but yeah. it was quite fair in that a lot of people, like I saw some former Australian cricketers, they weren't ripping into the curators. They were saying the idea of doing this is so ambitious. It was. It yeah. Was, it was probably we we're probably. Four to six months short in today's results. Um, developing the grass structure in the drop in, so it didn't have a strong rhizome or root system in it. Uh, that meant that when you rolled it out, it just it did give uneven bounce where there'd been some wood growth and there had been a little bit of knock bush growth. Um, yeah, so there was a little bit of inconsistent bounce, which we don't like in our pitches at all. We aim for a really consistent pitch that is uh, good for batters, good for bowlers, and it gives us a good game of crickets. Well, Having said that, the games of cricket there were all pretty good results. They were tight. It was just more bowler friendly. It was. Yeah. Harder to score, but at the end of the day, like it's still entertaining to watch. It is. Um, and the outfield probably didn't help our fours either. So the pitches were a little bit hard to play on, and then the outfield was um, a bit slower than cricketers are used to. So that combined with the pitch being hard, the batters weren't getting runs for their shots and it just, yeah. It would... So it was frustrating one side of the team. Yeah, yeah the batting side, yeah. Really helping the stats of the bowlers though, That's so. It. 
All right, man, what do we got here? These are the drop-ins. These are our bank of eight that we've always had here. Um, this is where they sit for winter, and we do a chunk of work. So we'll renovate these after the cricket season instead of at the start of cricket season, which kind of gets away from your traditional curating methods. Usually it's renovated after football season, get all the organic and stuff out that's been trampled in there through the football season. We obviously don't have that problem, so we now renovate them at, um, well, when, when we put them out in, again, that depends on what content we've got, but it's March or April, we'll rip them down to the ground, top dress them, fertilise them, and start getting the gross bats out here. You can see through here, we've planted up our block holes, so all the little bits of cooch sticking up there, we yep. punch some holes and then punch grass into it, uh, so that the block holes are fully covered by summer. Right. All right, so there's some, some TV crews on the oval, uh, so we can't go on right now. We're gonna go over and check out obviously the sheds and all the tools involved, and then we'll actually we have a look at the actual oval itself. Oh, here we are. This is the work shed, eh? It is, where all the magic happens. Well, before the magic happens. Yeah. Before the magic happens, that's it. Makes the magic happen. So, can we go through and you show me what all these little bits of equipment are? It is, yep. Yep. All right, so here we have our Amazon. It's a rooming or scarifying collection unit. Um, we run that over the oval and it collects all the organic matter to the hopper in the back. We can just bring it down here, empty it out, take it away in our grass trailer. Uh, obviously, the less organic in your profile, the better. Over here, we've got a couple of uh, older machines. So we've got a top dresser and our, what we call a whale. So it's a ride on super sopper. Uh, or even or not, it's one of our newer pieces of equipment. It's obviously second hand, but it's very handy for getting surface water off the oval, particularly in cricket season when the rain delays annoy everyone. Coming over here, we've got our turbine blowers. Um, we probably use them to dry the profile of the oval more than we should as well. Also good for cleaning up the parklands and car parks and get rid of all the uh, leaves and everything like that. Got our collection of fairway mowers over here. Um, got two for the oval, one for the back oval and one that we use for turf solution. Usually in here we've got our tractor, it's out in the oval at the moment with the verti drain on it. Another tractor out the back there. A little rotary mower that we mow the parklands with. And then we get further down here, this is uh, our maintenance department. So they've got their own little uh, quad bike and trailer that they carry all their tools around to all the different locations and start in that they need to fix. And then we get down into our buggies that have seen better days, but they help us get from A to B. Got our, this old girl. Yeah, that's it, the pro core. So this is another aerator. It can be solitine or holotine. Uh, we use it predominantly for coring the oval. So that's uh, a lot of walking. How long is that taking you to uh, If we're harvesting at the same time, it be a two day process. Yeah. Your feet are pretty sore by the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, as we keep coming through here, we're heading to our dry store and our wet store where we keep all of our fertilizer. All right. So in here, requires a bit of organizing at the moment. Uh, we've got fertilizer usually stay over this side with some seed. And then on this side, we've got all of our clay that we've kept dry over winter and we'll use coming into summer. Do brands come to you at all being like, oh, you're Adelaide Oval? Because I can see it both ways. Either they come to you go, we want the products, we'll help you out and bright. Yeah. Or they go, it's Adelaide Oval, they have all the money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Adelaide Oval surcharge. Yes. Uh, we do get that a fair bit um, with other things, fertilizers and fungicides and that. We're generally buying high amounts of it so we get a decent deal. Yeah, so they treat you fairly. Yes, yeah. As you can see, we've bought you got a bulk fertilizer right here. So <laughs> There's um, one application of granular for the oval, um, plus the uh, yeah. beet brew that we put out. 
and I think it's lime up about the same. So how much, so with, with these 20 litres, I'm guessing that's about just quick 500 litres? All up, 400 litres? Uh, yeah, probably, yeah. So how much, how long would that last? Uh, that's probably two applications worth, so probably a month. And um, so I use this product too, so that won't be just as good too. That's it. <laughs> I think yeah. so, yeah. 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 That's, that's what I was hoping for. I yeah. feel valid. Yeah. So this is the chemical storage. Yep, so this is where we get our spray unit and all of our foliar fertilizers. Um, ben was just asking why the spray unit's green. It's, we don't like using pigment, but sometimes in the middle of winter, the leaf's yellow. Uh, you just need a bit of green for it to trap the chlorophyll, get a bit of heat into the leaf, um, so we'll use pigment and as light as possible because we don't want to stain footballers' clothes and everything like that. Yeah. So JT, yes. what's this thing? Yeah, this is one of our grow lights. So we've got two of these smaller ones and then a bigger one in the race. Um, we don't have as many as say the MCG or Eddie had, but we also get a fair bit more sun than them. So grow lights, two things. You're looking at heat and then specific UV rays just to encourage grass growth, basically. Um, we'll use it for helping to germinate seed and then trying to maintain our soil temperatures. What time or how long do you have to have that on? And are you using it year round or just in the cool months? No, typically it's only during winter that we use them. Uh, we try and only use them in the one spot for two to three nights. Otherwise we find that the plant actually outgrows the nutrient that we've got there readily available for it and we start seeing it yellowing off. Wow, really? I just thought more would be better. So did we. But um, yeah, it was a like everything we do, it was a learning curve where we had to figure out how best to use them and what works best for us in our climate. You're telling me this is ryegrass year round? Yes, yep. So we have to oversow with ryegrass for footy season. Uh, and having such a dense canopy of rye, it just chokes the cooch out and we can't get it to re-germinate or re-establish itself during summer. So we're 100% rye, 100% of the year. How much water is that usually? Uh, yeah, summer it gets pretty difficult where we're having to irrigate most nights. Yeah. And do you just do a tiny bit to keep it wet or do you actually have to really go for it because it gets so hot and dry and uh we're on a perch water table here anyway so we have to we give the plant what it needs um usually what we are looking at is about four to five mil a night um on particularly hot periods we'll do potentially double that it's not too bad really it's not it's pretty good we no. use wetting agents and um being ryegrass in the middle of the summer, the roots are a little bit shorter, so you don't have to top up the entire reservoir of moisture in the soil, so it's... Now, the other thing about this is that there's a stitching. Yeah, um, we don't necessarily have a stitching, but we do have an artificial backing. Um, there is what's called the cyst system, which is stitching, and they use it a lot in um, Europe and on all of their soft pitches. They just did it at Cooper Stadium around the corner for the World Cup that they had. But we do, we have an artificial backing on all of our turf, um, and which classifies it as a ready to play turf. So we can replace turf out here and within 24 hours play a game of football or cricket on it, just due to the backing and the weight of the sod. So we're looking at about 100 kilos per square meter of sod. So show me the artificial stuff. Yeah, so down here we have a bit that's been affected by the umpires. Um, they're probably our worst nightmare in the middle of summer. So you can see there's a bit of rye starting to germinate down here that we would have spread out a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, where is that back? Oh, and then so here we have a synthetic fibre sticking out the top. So it's green, it's, it's literally synthetic grass. It just helps hold the profile together when it starts to bear out. And that helps with less injuries, less yeah, damage stability, to the Yeah, stability basically, yeah. 
So it's not it's not a visual thing at all. Uh, it's not, but that it does aid in the visual side of things um, when there's more fibres through the top. This one is quite old, actually, for replacement this section, so there's not a lot of fibres sticking out through the top. Nice. Right. Well, it looks like one of you guys that are doing some work. Yeah, we'll go have a look at that if you want. Let's do it. So we have Dylan out here aerating the oval at the moment. So the idea of aerating at this point in time is to decompact the profile create granite panels for the water and get some oxygen around the root system. So we just saw Marcus lift, it, lift up over the trays in the middle. Um, I think we're the only stadium in Australia that does a one-for-one -one tray replacement where we can lift one cricket pitch out and then put a grass tray back in. Mm -hmm. uh, the downside of that is that you obviously can't run the aerators through it because you'll destroy the tray that's underneath. Is it? because it goes too deep or you're watching the edges you're worried about the edges all right so these lines we're trying to get down about six inches uh to, to really aerate get the oxygen down the roots so we can create those drainage channels but the tray wall is probably only 35 40 mil below the surface so we do have to be very careful in that side just some people might ask they might go why not just aerate to 30 mil uh, we do do that. We do that with the Pro Tour though. It's a little bit easier and has left of the foot pressure on the big track was in the third day. So you still get something done? Yes, yeah. I was going to say like... We also, sorry, we also do air eight deeper into the trays, but we just come into the middle where we know we're not going to get a solid wall. Okay. Because it's quite interesting because like the centre area on any sort of local oval, it's the goal mouth and the centre bounce area that get the most wear and tear. Yeah, absolutely. So you would almost think that you want to have the most love and attention in those areas? Yeah, well, we're fortunate enough that we've just been able to replace uh, nearly 150 square metres of turf in the centre. We did that just uh, prior to the materials going out here because, again, it was worn out and would have created an need of the surface for the materials going. So do you do the whole trays or do you do it differently and do that? Uh, no, well it depends on how much turf we need to replace basically. So the trays themselves are 25 metres long by 30 metres wide um, which is a lot more than 140 square metres. So typically we'll try and aim for a 10 by 10 square metre uh, in the centre and just do that but this year we've just done a little bit bigger. We've got the cones for the square, Yep. but there's also these cones out in the rest of the field. What are they marking? Yeah, they're just our sprinklers. So we have um, nearly 70 sprinklers throughout the profile. Um, obviously, you don't want to hit them with a tractor uh, at $150 a sprinkler. So it gets, gets pricey. $150 a sprinkler? Yes. Have you ever broken one? Uh, we all have. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I do pride myself on not hitting them very often. <laughs> yes. Uh, what's the most embarrassing mistake you've made here? Uh, that's a good question. It's probably left the irrigation on under the covers before a training session for the cricket. But that was not good. Yes. <laughs> so you flooded the pitch that was yeah, supposed to be Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it went from spin friendly to seam friendly very quickly. <laughs> oh, did you get in trouble or they just uh, they, the nah, nice nah, nah, that's that's accidents happen and you learn from your mistakes and it hasn't happened again. <laughs> uh, some other questions. What height are you cutting it at? And is that gonna change depending on the season, the game, all this sort of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So at the moment we're at twenty eight mil, that's generally we're trying to be in between twenty six and thirty for football season. Uh, depending on growth, we could be cutting every second day or once a week. Um, it just depends on how much fertiliser we've given it and what the weather's like. Yep. In cricket season, we're down at your 12 to 14 mils, um, which is problematic with rye grass in 40 degree temperatures, but that's what cr uh, cricket requires. Is there PGR or anything else you can use to help it get smaller? Yeah, yeah, we do um, come out regularly in cricket season with our PDRs. Um, just helps to suck it back and we're not having to cut as often. We still, test match, we still cut every day regardless. But yeah, we do definitely utilise growth regulators. 
And what sort of evil acts did these guys do to have to get on the rakes? Yeah. Did somebody uh, put well, that's, tuna that's in, the, that in we the do. microwave at the, no, at the that's kitchen? Right. Don't get me started on tuna in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's um, Ben out there is just teaching the apprentices um, our level of attention to detail. So we're just raking up all the organic that's been kicked out over the weekend from the football and picked up with the verde drains. Uh, the less, like I said earlier, the less organic that you're trapping in your profile, the better your drainage and the better your nutrient availability is. So the cylinder mowers that we looked at before, best quality cut, but one of their downfalls is that they don't pick up, well they don't really have a suction action like a rotary mower would. Uh, yes I know, we've got catches for ours uh, that we cut always, we'll always cut and catch, but um, just having a dense sward of grass, it means there's a lot of leaf uh, and when you have footballers running over it, they'll kick it off and knock it around. And... Well, I've, I've noticed that like there's some heavy league stadiums, they mow them with a rotary mower after the game to sort of clean up some mess. Is that just for them or is no, it no, that similar? Yeah, we sometimes we'll do that. We're just a little bit bigger in scale yeah. uh, and it's a pretty time consuming. I've done that down at Cooper Stadium where um, Simon down there has a rotary vacuum that he uses and he uses it to suck up all the divots as well as just stand the leaf up. So they have to pattern mow the soccer in the same direction every week. So he reverses it so that the leaf stands back up and then he can give it a nice clean cut with his cylinder. Is that the worst job you can do though, raking? Surely. Uh, no, I don't mind that. That's all right. The divots is pretty time consuming. So all the boys were out here for the entire day yesterday and a bit of this morning to some divots after the game on the weekend. Uh, yeah, that's... What is your still about? Like, yeah, the girl. Uh, divot is pretty cool. Uh, they're just little tines that go on the ground lifted up. Yeah. What is... Because you guys have... You have soccer here sometimes. Yeah. Obviously cricket, obviously AFL. Yep. Concerts. Yep. Do you ever have any other sport codes? Uh, yeah, we, wow, we've had golf here, we've had stadium yeah, golf. golf really? here. Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty cool event. I hope that comes back one day. Um, they situate tee blocks out around the stadium, up in the stand and everything, and they've got one hole to aim at in the middle of the oval. Um, that's something different that we've had here. What else did we have? Uh, we had a boxing match here, so they had a stage right in the middle and tables and chairs all around. Yeah, it's pretty unique in respect to what we can have out here. So this is here for AFL. You literally had a game two nights ago. Yeah, Saturday it was on, so... Three nights three ago, days. something yep. like that. Yep. What... If I need to switch this over to... Uh, not cricket, because you need to put the wickets in. Yep. But if I was to switch this over to say a soccer match, yep. how long would that take you? Uh, we've just done a pretty tight turnaround where we had um, AFL on Thursday night and we had the children playing on Friday night. So that was a 24 hour period where everyone was people working in stages throughout the whole time. Um, washing out the AFL lines, we'll do that for four or five weeks in a row to make sure there's nothing sitting below the leaf. Uh, but you can't see it. You've got 50 square centre circles. It's taking the AFL goal down, bringing the soccer goal down, putting them in, and then marking the soccer. So do you do the painting here? No, we don't. We get a sign writer in for that. How long does that take? That's, that's a work of art. It is, yeah. Bill does a good job. Uh, he'll come in on Friday and spend most of the day here between the 50 logos, the goal squares, and the fruit wing logos. Now you do all the line that right? Yeah, correct. That must do you, do you must have a straight line, right? Uh well we streamline all the straight lines, yeah. We don't don't freehand the string uh, the straight ones. Yeah, because I I would be so nervous yeah. doing that job. Yeah, yeah. Knowing that potentially fifty thousand people are watching us, yeah. That's piece of shit. So somebody else comes and does this. Yeah. You do these lines, you also do the curves. Yeah. At the fifty. How do you do that so it's a perfect curve? Uh, initially, we mark it out with a tape measure and dash it and make it right. But week on week, it's follow your line and just practice make it perfect, basically. So that time that you're marking out the first time you're doing it, yep. that's going to take 
a leg tag really carefully. Yeah, we do spend a fair bit of time making sure that the person is in my spa bag in the right spot. So tell us what this is. So this is what we call a ply fix. It's just a little plastic thing that we put into the corner of all of our squares uh, so that the square is marked in the same location every single time. Yeah, so these are some apprentices out there, right? Yeah, and Ben, who's teaching them the ropes. How long do you have to be here before you get trusted with the line? Uh, no, we've thrown these boys in the deep end, so they've already done a bunch of uh, line marking. And Fortunately, uh, they picked it up very well and no one's even noticed that it was an apprentice that did it. So, props to them. Well done, well, boys. If somebody was not watching this, maybe they're in school or they're just yeah, early on in their career, yep. what would you recommend for somebody, maybe they're not in Adelaide, but they want to get into this type of work? Yep. What path would you recommend someone takes? Yeah, absolutely. So, Will and Liam both did work experience for us uh, and were really good then, and they were smart enough to stay in contact and keep the communication open and then when we had availability we actually reached out to them but in terms of getting into sports turf it's go and see um, an apprenticeship provider or go and hit up your local golf clubs or your um, bigger ovals and see if you can get an apprenticeship through there. Where did you start? What was your first Born related job. Yeah, uh, I started at the council, so I was looking after two suburban grounds. I did six months there, and then I transferred to Amy Stadium, which was the AFL over there, and I've been with either SAFL or Adelaide Oval ever since. Well, JT, thank you so much for coming on. I'll give you the backward handshake again. That was fascinating, and. Um, my pants are a little bit tighter than they were when they first started this podcast, if I'm being 100% honest. Uh, Ben's embarrassed at me for saying that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thank you so much. The lawn lovers out there, they don't get this content much. And for Adelaide Oval to say yes to us doing this, really cool. And people, we'll see you in the next podcast.